quite typically I'll ask this question. So this might be the first question that I ask actually in a, in a sort of maths uh, mock interview. I'd ask people to draw for me what does Linux look like? Most of the time, um, students, if they've been studying for their A-levels, if they've paid attention in class, they'll know how to work it out, okay? Or, or they'll know it, okay? I would recommend that you know it. If you know how to work it out, that's okay, but, you know, try and try and get the general graphs of e to the x, ln x, things like that. 1 over x, 1 over x squared, sin x, cos x, those things, you need to know what they look like, okay? Or you need to be able to work them out pretty quick. Okay, so if we draw the graph of ln x here, I'm going to draw it looking something like this. So it crosses here at 1. It is in fact a reflection of e to the x in the line uh, y equals x, if that's interesting, if you just want to learn one of them. Um, and that's because they're inverse functions of each other. Um, so that's quite plain. Um, if you put x into one of them, you will get the y of the other one. Does that make sense? So if you put in, um, if you put in, if you've got y equals e to the x, and you put in x equals 2, you'll get e to the 2 as your y. If you put that value into your, into your LUN, into your LUN graph, you'll get back 2. And so this is really like saying, if I put in e to the 2 here, then I should get a value of, um, two on this axis. If I then kind of reflect that two in the line y equals x, so there's our line y equals x, if I sort of reflect that value, this is not perfect here, but if I did, it would kind of come down to two, okay? And then if I put that two back in again, into my graph of um, e to the x, I should get out e squared. And again, this is still not perfect, but if I reflect that in my mirror line, it should give me back my e, e squared here. So they're inverses of each other, and all inverses have this kind of behavior where they can be seen as a reflection of each other in the line y equals x. Okay, so if I get rid of that here, I was just explaining how you might just need to learn one of the graphs, because then if you know the other one is a reflection, then that would make things a little bit easier maybe. Um, it may also help you draw the draw the inverse functions for trigonometric functions. Okay, so if I draw this graph, so this is y equals ln x. So that's my starter question, the thing that I usually first ask someone. Then I might say, can you tell me what y equals ln of ln x looks like? Okay, and students at this point usually start trying to manipulate things. They might try and put some x values in. So they'll try and put something like x equals 1 in here, maybe. And they'd see that then ln of 1, 0, and it's not defined for y equals ln 0. Okay, or, or it basically is asymptotic. So what you can actually prove is if you put in x equals 1, then ln 1 is 0. And so you're doing ln 0. And that's kind of like saying, I'm looking at the logarithm of this line, okay? Now, logarithms don't take negative values, okay? And the natural logarithm does not take a negative value. So this should not be defined any point after this asymptote here, okay? So in fact, the asymptote, it will look something like this. The asymptote is at now at x equals 1, and it will cross a point here, and it is much, much shallower, but still increasing. Okay, so at what point does it cross here? Well, that will be when y equals zero. So I can just say zero is equal to ln of ln of x. If I put everything to the power of e, then I can get rid of one of these learns on the right-hand side, and it's e to the zero, which is just one. Okay, so that's just e is equal to ln x. And it worked once, so let's do it again. Let's put everything to the power of e again. We'll get e to the power of e is equal to just x. Okay, so this point here is e to the e. Now, at this point, if, if a student has done all of this correctly, I might then say, well, I'm going to define a function now, yn, which is ln n times. So learn of learn of learn of dot 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 learn x. 
okay? And this is this is n many learns all applied to each, to to the previous learn x, okay? And the way that a student might start going about this if they if they don't immediately spot the iterative um, behavior of this is they'll think about if there were three natural logarithms, and they'll realize that now at this point any value after e to the e, well. This is kind of my y1 graph. This would be my y2 graph. If I'm actually looking at y3, it's just the ln, the natural logarithm of the graph y2. So at any point where y2 is negative, y3 will not exist. So that means there's going to be an asymptote at e, I don't know why I'm drawing that one dotted, at e to the e. So it should curve out like this. And following the same logic as last time, There'll be three learns here. So in fact, we'll have to put everything to the power of e one more time. And this point here will be e to the e to the e. Now at this point, I do expect a student to have, have worked out the pattern here. And I expect them to be able to write down straight away that the yn graph, I'm not drawing it to scale here, but the yn graph will, n graph will, have, its, um, will have its asymptote at e to the e to the e dot 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 and there'll be n um, so this is the y3 the y2 and it, and it has no e's there so it will be n minus two of these okay sort of e's in a row um, in fact do I believe that uh, well the y this is the y3 and that's e to the e so it's actually n minus uh, n minus one, okay, for the e to the e, and that's what I mean by in a row. I'm, I'm counting the e at the bottom there. So my y three graph has its asymptote e to the e. So my y four graph would have its asymptote at e to the e to the e. My y n will have e to the e to the e n minus one times, okay. And so where will it cross the axis? Well, that's just to the power of e one more time. So y3 crossed, crossed the axis at e to the e to the e. Okay, three lots of e there. Okay. Um, so in fact, we do expect it to come up and it will cross the axis somewhere and there'll be e to the e continuing n many times. Okay, so that's kind of iterative behavior that I'd expect a student to be able to spot. Okay, just to give them an idea of the kind of relationships I expect to expect to find. Okay, so let's try another kind of um, infinite problem. And this is one that I actually got in my own interview. So uh, I got, well, actually, I wasn't even given an X to start with. I was just told to evaluate this expression. Okay, so that's two plus, and then we'll do another square root. Sorry, this doesn't really look like one. Two plus, and it continues. Okay, so there'll be another square root here with two and then a plus on the inside. I was just asked to evaluate this. I wasn't told anything about it, just evaluate it. So well, how do you approach a problem like this? The first thing that I did was I said, okay, well, it might be nice to label it. So I'll label it X. And then I said, in fact, well, there's square roots in this equation now. Maybe, you know, the thing that I usually do with square roots is try and get rid of them. So I'll square it. So I came to the point where I was at x squared equals 2 plus, then all the other square roots were still there. 2 plus square root, 2 plus dot, dot, dot. Okay. Now, this function is, well, this expression is uh, interesting because labeling this as x, you see immediately that this here is x, but also this here is x. And that's what you're trying to do in a lot of problems with infinity, is you're trying to identify um, some relationship between an expression that you've, you've maybe squared or square rooted or then whatever you do with it, put it to the power of, you know, uh, put it to the power of x or use the natural logarithm on it or something like that. Whenever you do that, you want to see if you can find x or find maybe like the next x down or 
the next y down, like yn minus 1. Find those kind of iterative relationships. Because as soon as you label this as x, then you've got a nice, easy quadratic that you can solve. Okay, So setting this equal to 0, I can factorize this into two brackets, x minus 2 and x plus 1. Okay, and that gives me two solutions. That's x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. Okay, but actually, in a weird way, that was the easy part of this question. And this doesn't usually happen, but a lot of questions um, will tend to get harder. And a, a harder thing here is to kind of explain where the negative 1 comes from and maybe kind of reverse engineer this question to try and find an infinite square root expression for negative 1. That's the hard thing. So if you want to explain where the negative 1 came from, then the answer really lies in the fact that you squared something. When you square something, you lose some information about whether it was positive or negative. Okay. And in fact, in this problem, if there was a negative sign here at the start, then when you square it, you would get the same expression, but you'd no longer be able to say that this is x. You would have to actually say that this is negative x because you labeled x and it had a negative sign at the start. So this is where the minus 1 root comes from because that actually would not give the same, um, would not give the same quadratic. So if you had a negative sign at the start, this would not give the same quadratic. We know that one of the answers should be negative 2 because this, this expression here, we evaluated it to 2. There's just a negative sign there. So in fact, you would have to say that that's a minus x there if you had a negative 2 at the start. And then this would give a plus x and this would, this would factorize differently. Okay. So what you can do instead, if you want to make a sort of infinite expression, um, infinite number of square roots for... Um, for your negative 1 root, you can say that it has to suit this quadratic equation, or it has to suit x squared um, is equal to 2 plus x, 2 plus itself. Okay, And putting a negative sign at the front here won't do it. That's, that's not enough. But what about if you put a negative sign here, and a negative sign here, and a negative sign here? What if, that, if they were all negative signs? Then in fact, when you square this, you're going to get 2 minus 2 minus. And there'll be loads of minuses in here. And in fact, you started with something negative. So you can write this as 2 plus x. So this is the other infinite number of square roots in an expression that suits this quadratic equation. And there are only two. And so the the infinite square root expression for x equals negative 1 is minus the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 minus the square root of 2 going on forever. And that's the tough part of this question. Reverse engineering this to find the infinite square root expression for x equals negative 1 is pretty difficult. Um, so well done if you got that. Great.